Good morning. It's great to see you all once again. I wanted to start off by saying thank you for the card. I got the card from the church that you sent. Uh, many kind words and words of encouragement. I wanted to say thank you and and echo um, the thank you for the opportunity to, to preach here. It, I learn the most whenever I'm preparing a lesson, and so I'm very thankful for the opportunity. Um, the scripture reading this morning was from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and uh, we got some, it spoke a little bit about this chapter 1, uh, verse 24, it says, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, and it contrasts that with the wisdom of the world, uh, this idea that a man could be our savior and be crucified would be considered foolish by some. Uh, but, but Paul goes on to make his argument. So I, I, I want to thank um, Brother Charles for his prayer earlier. Uh, part of what he said in his prayer was, uh, let us be the kind of people that take the words, God's word, and internalize it uh, so that it would affect our decision making. And that's really what I wanted to kind of talk about this morning, is the way that we reason, the way that we make decisions, and really try to think deep about what's the source uh, of you know, the, the way that we logic and make decisions. And I think that it's an important thing to be concerned about because the natural way to reason is according to the flesh. That's sort of the default uh, logical process. That's the natural way to reason and make decisions is according to the flesh. And so pursuit of godly wisdom to try and reason the way that God would have us to do takes faith because, well, it's non-intuitive from some human standards, from some worldly standards, um, from some fleshly standards. You would not come upon the, the wisdom and the teachings that Jesus prescribed for us. For example, D Jesus taught uh, to be selfless, to pursue to serve others and to put others above yourself. And naturally, in, in the natural world, that's uh, not what you see. Trees for, aren't, don't have souls. They don't think like we do. And they will fight for sunlight at the expense of other trees. <laughs> they don't care about other trees. And, you know, the fleshly way of reasoning is according to physical processes, just like it is for the tree. And if we're not careful, we will seek our own at the expense of others. And so I just want us to dive in a little bit to think about uh, how we reason and how we make decisions. Christ's kingdom, of course, is not of the world. It, it is not sourced in a fleshly wisdom. God's wisdom and worldly wisdom are in opposition. 1 Corinthians 3.19, a little bit later from our scripture reading, says, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. And uh, like we said earlier, worldly wisdom is ultimately fleshly, which is an opposition to the spirit. This is Galatians 5.17. The flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. We're called to reason differently. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says to be transformed by renewing your mind. Literally the way that you reason there. Uh, so the lesson this morning is a reminder to approach all situations with a godly wisdom. I feel like I'm too loud here. Uh, to approach all situations with a godly wisdom. Ultimately, anytime we're struggling with something and we're seeking advice, to consult the right source because we're tempted to do it the human way and to seek con consultation from other sources. Uh, and so to do that this morning, I want to look at a non-example. I want to look at a, an example where somebody didn't do that and uh, well, we'll see what the consequences of that was. So if you have a Bible... Turn with me to the book of uh, First Kings. Um, King, the book of Kings was originally one book. First and Second Kings were one book. And if you're familiar with the book of Kings, you know, the format of it is sort of a king is introduced. It will tell you how long they served, who was serving in the other kingdom. You know, if it was introducing a king of northern Israel, it would say during the ex- Next year of reign of the king of Judah, so-and-so became king. It'll tell you how long they reigned. Uh, sometimes it'll give a little, a little bit of information, some things that happened while they were king, some events of their life. Sometimes it's a long account. 
couple chapters, several chapters. Sometimes it's only a few verses. Um, but another characteristic, every time a king is introduced, they're sort of graded, right? They're called either a good king or a bad king. Uh, did they, were they uh, do what was evil in the sight of God? Or did, did they do what was righteous in the sight of God? And uh, the criteria for determining whether they were, did evil in the sight of God or not was whether or not they did his commandments, stuck to his statutes, or whether they led Israel into idol worship. You know, did they remove the high places or not? Things like this. What's interesting is when you read about several of the kings, there's one king every time um, a, a bad king is mentioned. This king did evil in the sight of God. Every time one of those is mentioned, or often, there's one king whose name is sort of attached to that. You remember who that was? It was Jeroboam. And I went through and I counted at least for Ahaziah, Jehoram, Jehu, Jehoahaz, Amaziah, Zechariah, Menahem, Pekahiah, Pekah. Several, multiple kings, when it says they did evil in the sight of the God, it says uh, that they did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam. Jeroboam had a lasting legacy in the book of Kings, and it was not a good one. He was remembered um, for the one who introduced several practices that were adhered to for all of his success, many of his successors. Um, and so I want to talk about Jeroboam this morning. Um, so this is going to bring us, we'll be in 1 Kings chapter 11 if you've got a Bible and want to turn there. Now remember where we are. I want to sort of set the stage for where we are historically in 1 Kings chapter 11. If you remember, um, okay, so Saul was the first king and then David became king, and then in 2 Samuel chapter 7, God tells David that you're going to be an everlasting kingdom. And we understand now with our 2020 hindsight that that was ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. Um, but, you know, if you're reading the Bible for the first time and you don't know this, you get to the end of 2 Samuel, Samuel or, uh, David dies, and then Solomon becomes king. Okay, we expect this if we interpret 2 Samuel uh, 7, 14 in that prophecy concerning David to be a literal kingdom. We expect this. Solomon becomes king and things start off great, right? He, he asks for wisdom, a worthy request, and he gets wisdom. He gathers wealth. He builds the temple. Things are going excellent. Uh, but then, of course, things go south, starting in 1 Kings chapter 11. The king Solomon loved many foreign women. This is verse 1, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the sons of Israel, you shall not associate with them, nor shall they associate with you, for they will surely turn your heart away after other gods. But Solomon held fast to these in love. He had several hundred wives. Skip down to verse 4, for Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God. Uh, as the Lord David, his father, had been. Um, and then verse 6, Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord fully as David, his father, had done. So he introduces idol worship. He's drawn away after these many wives, and God is going to pull the kingdom from him. He's going to split the kingdom. And, um, and so this is where Jeroboam comes in. So in, in chapter 11, what I'd like to do is I just want to, you know, maybe you're familiar with the account of Jeroboam. Maybe not. What we're going to do is we're going to just survey sort of chapters 11 and 12 and a little bit of 14, the, what's written about Jeroboam there. And then I want to draw out uh, a couple of points concerning what is recorded for us in Jeroboam. All right, so really quickly, in chapter 11, um, verse, chapter 11, verse 26, uh, Jeroboam is introduced. He's called an Ephraimite. He's called Solomon's servant, which becomes clarified for us a little bit later in verse 28. And it says he rebelled against Solomon, and it clarifies that for us in verse 27. It says the reason he rebelled uh, was because Solomon built the millow and closed up the breach of the city. Now, what was the millow? I mean, this is the reason why Jeroboam rebelled, apparently. A, a millow is mentioned in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 9. There it appears to be this thing that was uh, a structure built that surrounded the city. You probably have a footnote in your Bible that calls it a citadel. It was a fortress for protecting the city. Uh, and why was this a problem? Something we'll learn a little bit later when Jeroboam is presenting his grievances is uh, this was built on the back of forced labor. And so Jeroboam and many of the people were unhappy with this. Um, 
and well, we'll see what Rehoboam does to exacerbate those matters in, in a little bit. Chapter 11, verse 28, Jeroboam is put in charge of this work. Uh, he was in, ser in service to Solomon for this reason. And then you can see where Jeroboam is told, you're going to be king. Look at this. Let's read this in chapter 11, starting in verse 30. Uh, let's see. Chapter 11, verse 30, it says, Then Ahijah took hold of the new cloak which was on him and tore it into 12 pieces. He said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and give you ten tribes. Now, just pause there for a minute. You, you gotta, if you're Jeroboam, you've got to be feeling, I mean, maybe humbled. Whoa, this is a remarkable responsibility that's coming on my shoulders. Put yourself in Jeroboam's shoes here. He continues, verse 32, but he will have one tribe, uh, talking about Rahab, or Solomon, for the sake of my servant David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen for the tribes of Israel, because they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtoreth, the god of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of Moab, Milcom, the god of the sons of Ammon. They have not walked in my ways, doing what is right in my sight, and observing my statutes and my ordinances, as his father David did. Nevertheless, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him ruler all the days of his life for the sake of my servant David, whom I chose, who observed my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom from his son's hand uh, and give it to you, even ten tribes. But to his son I will give one tribe, that will be Rehoboam, that my servant David may have a lamp always before me in Jerusalem, the city where I have chosen for myself to put my name. I will take you, and you shall reign over whatever you desire, and you shall... be king and walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight by observing my statutes and my commandments as my servant David did, then I will be with you and build you an enduring house as I built for David and I will give Israel to you. Thus I will afflict the descendants of David for this, but not always. So Ahijah tells Jer uh, Jeroboam he's going to be given 10 tribes um, and we can debate about what the other two were. Some think that it was Judah, which would be given to Rehoboam, and the second was, was the tribe of Levi. Some think that it was um, Judah and Benjamin, because as we'll see in a minute, Benjamin goes to war, basically, with Judah whenever they're gathering troops, because Jerusalem sort of was in both Benjamin and Judah. The point is that Jeroboam is going to be given ten tribes. Uh, and what's interesting is he's told why Solomon is losing his portion of the kingdom. That's important. He has an example before him of what not to do um, in, in verse 33. It spells out the reasons why the kingdom was being ripped away from Solomon. And God does this all the time. We're reading through Isaiah at home. And in Isaiah, God announces judgment on several nations, Judah, Israel, Assyria, Syria, Egypt, Ethiopia, Tyre, Sidon, and every single time. He doesn't do it without saying, here's the reason why. So Jeroboam says, I'm giving you uh, 10 tribes. I'm taking it away from Rehoboam and here's the, or taking it away from Solomon. And here's the reason. You have a non-example. Don't do what he did. And he was, here's what's interesting to me. He was promised a lasting dynasty like David. You know, Jews in the time of Jesus revered David. Um, we understand this by, by reading the scriptures, what's recorded in the Psalms, uh, the way that the New Testament apostles and writers referred to David. They used that in their arguments against uh, the Jews for who Jesus was. David was revered, and Jeroboam is told, I will give you an enduring kingdom like the one for David. The difference here was that his was uh, conditioned on keeping God's statutes, and you don't see a similar condition for David um, in in 2 Samuel. Okay, so this doesn't happen right away. In fact, Solomon hears about it and he wants to kill Jeroboam. So in verse 40, Jer uh, Jeroboam's going to flee to Egypt um, to, to get away from Solomon. And then in, uh, at the start of chapter 12, Rehoboam finally becomes king. Solomon dies, Rehoboam becomes king, so Jeroboam now feels safe. He comes back from Egypt. Um, but he doesn't rebel at first. You might think, well, God promised me I was going to be king. Let's go back and let's just take the kingdom, right? He doesn't. He comes back, and they make a request to Rehoboam. They ask for a lighter load. They say, your father put a heavy yoke on us in building this millow or whatever it was. Lighten the load for us, right? And if you're familiar with the story, you know what Rehoboam does. 
he considers, let me go and talk to the elders of Israel, some older men, and ask, what's your wisdom? What should I do about this request from the people? It wasn't just Jeroboam, but he was one of the people there asking Rehoboam to lighten the load. So he asks older men for their wise counsel, and then he also consults younger men, his friends. And as the story goes, the older men say, yeah, lighten the load. The other ones say, make it harder, actually. Um, let's see, let's, let's, let's read this, actually. Um, in verses 6 through 11, he says, um, in verse 10, Your father made our yoke heavy, now make it lighter for us, but you shall speak to them. Here's what Jeroboam, what his friends tell him to say is, My little finger is thicker than my father's loins. So, um, unfortunately, he takes the advice of the younger men, makes the yoke heavy, uh, the people eventually revolt. This is in chapter 12, verses 16 through 18. This was a majority of the people movement. Um, and then finally, in chapter 20, Jeroboam is, is made king. Okay, It came about when all Israel, this is uh, 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 20. When all Israel heard that Jeroboam had returned, they sent and called him to the assembly and made him king over all Israel. None but the tribe of Judah followed the house of David. Now, Things have, should have come full circle now for Jeroboam. He was told, you're going to become king, and here's the reason why you're going to become king, from a prophet, Ahijah. And then he becomes king. Now, the hindsight that he should have had is, oh my goodness, this is from God. This is, this is true. It wasn't just some false prophet. And that's uh, spelled out for us in verse 15. It says, the king did not listen to the people, for it was a turn of events from the Lord that he might establish his word, which the Lord spoke through Ahijah, the Shilonite, to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. So this is, this whole turn of events to bring about Jeroboam to become king is from God. It was to bring about the prophecy that was given to Jeroboam through Ahijah. Now, I don't know about you, but this, is, this would motivate me, right, to put my trust in God in, in this situation. He told me that I'd have an enduring kingdom if I keep his commandments. I'm going to be wholly devoted to him, you would think. Um, and then what happens after that in verses 21 through 24, finally, there's definitely tension between Israel and Judah. Um, and Rehoboam uh, musters up some troops from Judah and also Benjamin to try and take militant, militant action. And then God discourages it. Okay, so that's where we are. Jeroboam has taken over the kingdom. What we're going to read next is sort of the crux, the meat of this lesson here. It's where Jeroboam introduces these, some institutions that are later referred to as the sins of Jeroboam. You did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam. So let's read about what this is. All right, this starts in chapter 26 through 27. Uh, and, and as we do this, sorry, chapter 12, verses 26 um, through 33, actually. As we do this, I want you to think about what was the motivation for Jeroboam doing these things. And the reason for that, and I'll touch on this later, is not because I don't think any of us are susceptible to making specifically the same mistakes that Jeroboam did. Like, I'm not worried about any of us appointing non-Levitical priests. It was wrong for him to do that. But I, I, we're not susceptible to that, I don't think. But I want you to think about why did he do this? Because the temptation, I think, is, is relevant for us. We could fall prey to what he fell prey to ultimately at the source of the matter. All right, so let's read this. Chapter 12, starting in verse 26. Jeroboam said in his heart, now the kingdom will return to the house of David. If this people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will return to their Lord, even to Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So, Jeroboam is worried about what's happening right now is there's a feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, where everyone was supposed to go to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. And Jeroboam's worried. He's thinking, if these people go to Jerusalem, which is probably a fun time for them, a holiday, um, you know, eating lots of food, hanging out, and he's worried that they're going to, he's going to lose their allegiance, that they will pledge their allegiance to Rehoboam. So the worry is starting. I want to focus on that. He's worried about something that has not even materialized yet. So he's worried about this, and so he seeks consultation in verse 28. Let's keep reading. So the king consulted, and we'll pause right there for a moment. Is that good advice? 
Is it good to seek counsel when you're struggling with something? Jeroboam's worried about something. What should I do in this situation? So let me seek counsel. But the source of the counsel is critically important. And as we're going to see here, it doesn't tell us who he consulted with, but it for sure was not God. It for sure was not consultation that was consistent with God's wisdom, as we will see, because, well, let's read here the foolish solution um, that follows this godless counsel. Here's what it says. Here's what he does. He consulted in verse 28, and he made two golden calves. And he said to them, it is too much for you to go to Jerusalem. Behold your gods, O Israel, that brought you up from the land of Egypt. He set one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. Now this thing became a sin. For the people went to worship before the ones as far as Dan. And he made houses on high places and made priests from among all the people who were not of the sons of Levi. Jeroboam instituted a feast in the eighth month on the 15th day of the month, like the feast which is in Judah. And he went up to the altar. Thus he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves which he had made. And he stationed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. Then he went up to the altar which he had made in Bethel on the 15th day in the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised in his own heart. And he instituted a feast for the sons of Israel and went up to the altar to burn incense. All right, so let's look at these individual sins uh, one at a time here. So the first was idol worship. In, uh, chapter, in verse 28, he creates these, these calves and it says, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold your gods that brought you up from the land of Egypt. What's interesting is that verse sounds very familiar. Exodus chapter 32, verse 4 says, this is Aaron, I believe, he took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf and said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now, Jeroboam had to have been familiar with this story. If he had become king and was adhering to Torah, he, as king, was supposed to write down the law, and he would have been familiar with this, and I'm sure he was. And we can conjure up ideas why he just blatantly ignored it. I mean, it baffles me, and it probably does you too, that he would say this thing, which is exactly nearly word for word, the same thing that was said in the infamous golden calf incident uh, following you know, the exodus of Egypt. Uh, but he falls into the same, the same practices. The second sin, he made cult places and shrines. This is in direct violation of Deuteronomy chapter 12 verses 13 and 14, which says, be careful that you do not offer your burnt offerings in every cultic place that you see, but in the place which the Lord chooses in one of your tribes, there you shall offer your burnt offerings, and there you shall do all that I command you. That was to be Jerusalem, not Dan, not Bethel, Jerusalem. Uh, He appointed non-Levitical priests. Not anyone could be a priest. You had to be from the tribe of Levi, and you had to be a descendant of Aaron in in the line of the Aaronite priesthood. The second thing was they celebrated a feast on the 15th of the 8th month, and this was the Feast of Tabernacles. That was supposed to be celebrated on the 7th month, month 7, day 15. But he says, no, 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 we're going to do it on month 8, day 15, just a month later. Um, And we'll talk about later why he probably did that. And this, let's just do it here. I don't want you to go to Jerusalem and be potentially, you know, uh, pledge your allegiance to Rehoboam. So this is the downfall. These are the things that are referred to as the sins of Jeroboam. And eventually he is punished for this. In chapter 14, finally, verses 1 through 5, Jeroboam becomes sick. He sends his wife to Ahijah, the prophet who prophesied that, that he would become king, uh, to determine his fate because his son was sick. And so she disguises herself. He's like, you know, Disguise yourself so he doesn't recognize you, um, because if he knows you're my wife, he might give you, you know, a bad word or something. But, of course, Ahijah knows who she is. And here's his response. Here's Ahijah's response in uh, 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 7. It says, Go and say to Jeroboam, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Because I exalted you from among the people and made you leader over my people Israel, and tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you, Yet, you have not, basically saying, I did this remarkable thing. I selected you, Jeroboam. And Jeroboam ought to revered that position that had been placed on him. And here's what he does with it. Yet, you have not been like my servant David, who kept my commandments and who followed me with all his heart. 
to do only that which was right in my sight. You also have done more evil than all who were before you and have gone and made for yourself other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger and have cast me behind your back. Therefore, behold, I am bringing calamity on the house of Jeroboam and will cut off from Jeroboam every male person, both bond and free in Israel, and I will make a clean sweep of the house of Jeroboam as one sweeps away the dung until it's all gone. Anyone belonging to Jeroboam who dies in the city, the dogs will eat, and he who dies in the field, uh, the birds of the heaven will eat. For the Lord has spoken it. Now you arise, go to your house. When your feet enter the city, the child will die. The child who is sick, who they sought to get a response from Ahijah in the first place. All Israel shall mourn for him and bury him, for he alone of Jeroboam's family will come to the grave, because in him something good was found toward the Lord God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. Moreover, the Lord will raise up for himself a king over Israel who will cut off the house of Jeroboam this day and from now on. So he reminds Jeroboam in his response that God was responsible for him becoming king, something that Jeroboam knew. Jeroboam, you did not come to this position of king on your own. This was God's doing. And you ought to have humbled yourself and pledged your loyalty to God in all circumstances, no matter what you might have been worried about, no matter if the king did go back to Rehoboam. You stay loyal to me. But Jeroboam took matters into his own hands. He was punished for his disobedience. And again, just like other times where God pronounces judgment on people, he tells them, why he's doing it. He was punished for his idol worship, it tells us in verse 9. Um, and then I, I didn't read this before, um, but he in verse 15 and 16, let's read this. It says, this is another consequence of this. It says, for the Lord will strike Israel as a reed is shaken in the water, and he will uproot Israel from this good land which he had given to their fathers, will scatter them beyond the Euphrates River, because they have made their ashram provoking the Lord to anger. He will give up Israel on account of the sins of Jeroboam, which he committed and with which he made Israel to sin. He ultimately is the start of leading Israel away, and they are exiled by Assyria later in, in chapter in Second Kings, um, chapter 17-ish. Um, and so that eventually comes true. And thus, all the kings after him that follow in his footsteps, it's referred to them um, um, not departing after the sins of Jeroboam. Okay. So that's the account of Jeroboam. Here's the three points that I'd like to make as we review what happened. How could this have happened, given such a strong promise? Number one, I think Jeroboam lacked faith. I think it started there. That was the start of all the subsequent sins and poor decisions. The second is that Jeroboam took counsel, but it was not from God. He sought advice and consultation that was ultimately not uh, from God. And then thirdly, Jeroboam, here's the third point, Jeroboam approached service to God based on a human wisdom. He approached service to God reasoning like, like people do, maybe like a business person does. He brought that source of logic into his service to God. All right, so let's take these one by one. Number one, Jeroboam lacked faith. That was the start of all of his problems. He, he had perceived a problem that was only that. It was a perception, right? This was, he was worried about the people leaving and going to Rehoboam, and this had not happened. This had not materialized. It was a non-situation. He was worried about something that was not there. And maybe you, and I know I have been guilty of this, you get worried about potential things that are not even things yet. You get worried about situations that might happen, and they dominate your thoughts. Man, if this happens, how are we going to make this work? And they haven't even happened yet. And you let that worry about a non-situation lead to sin. Jesus speaks about worry in the Sermon on the Mount, something we're all very familiar with but ought to revisit several times. Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 through 34. Do not worry then, saying, What will we eat? What will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So what's the point? Seek God first. Let that dominate your thoughts. Everything else will be taken care of. 
And that does take faith, ultimately. Why? Well, because it's human, na- it's human nature to do what Jeroboam did. T- to worry about things that aren't there. To expect things not to be taken care of. And this, of course, is an internal battle that we are dealing with. Our own spiritual batters, uh, battles. And we need to be reminded that God gives us the tools to battle this worry. He gives us the weaponry to battle this anxiety. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 through 13, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. I wonder if sometimes, well, we need to make sure that we don't underestimate the power of this armor. It, it is so powerful. And I think we are maybe tempted to underestimate its power because it's not tangible in the way that we think about other weapons or tools, right? I mean, um, well, a, a literal sword, you can see it, right? Imagine having, I don't know if you watch Star Wars or whatever, but imagine being in their time and you had like a lightsaber, right? This awesome, cool weapon um, that that no normal sword could stand against. You would feel empowered just by looking at that awesome technology that was clearly dominant to other inferior weaponry, right? Because it's tangible. The armor of God, albeit not as tangible in, in the physical sense, we need not underestimate its power. The spirit, the sword of the spirit is a piece of that armor. It says that that's the word of God, and that is infinitely powerful. And we have this counsel to remain faithful and to trust the power of the word, to be diligent in prayer, in Bible study, and and in meditating on what we study in our Bibles, reflecting on it, um, in our devotion to each other, consider how to stir one another up to love and good works to be around each other when we commune together and reflect on the sacrifice of Jesus. This is the armor that God has given us, and it does work. And it brings us the peace that is needed in the face of anxiety. Jeroboam let that get the best of him. But we have tools that give us peace. Paul said, I have a peace that surpasses all understanding. And there is no amount of anxiety and worry that can dominate that. I like the words of the psalmist in Psalm 131. It says, O Lord, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty, nor do I involve myself in great matters or in things too difficult for me. Surely I have composed and quieted my soul. I I have thought about that a lot as I've been preparing this lesson. Because it seems like your internal self can be really loud sometimes. Right? And like find every little thing to to get uh, stirred up about. And he says... He says, I have composed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child rests against its mother, my soul is like a weaned child within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forever. This is godly counsel for overcoming worry. And it's clearly different than uh, the counsel that Jeroboam sought, right? Jeroboam sought counsel. This is point number two. He sought counsel, but it wasn't from God. Very rarely are decisions made by a person without poor counsel, whether that be counsel from themselves, they seek themselves for consultation. But if it's a poor decision, it was probably sourced from a poor counsel. And it may not have been the same problems that Jeroboam faced, but there are decisions that we face that are very real, where we must be careful about where we seek consultation. Decisions about how you approach your relationship with your spouse. Right? There is um, a worldly way of going about that. You can talk to read different self-help books, and they'll tell you how to approach your relationship with your spouse, and then there's God's way. Seek consultation from the, the right source. Decisions about how you parent your children. How are we going to parent our children? Where are we going to, what uh, sources are we going to consult from this? The world often has a very different approach from God. This isn't exactly the things that Jeroboam was dealing with, it says, but these are decisions we have to make. Decisions about how you handle conflict at work. 
You ever seen tensions between people at work? How do you handle that? How, how should I go about this, God? And there's self-help books for that too. Consult the Bible. Decision. It's about how we feel about Jesus. There's a pattern of the world for teaching who Jesus was, and then there's the pattern of the Bible. What about decisions about how we approach God in worship? How should I approach God in worship, in my service to God in worship? There's a pattern of the world. And then there's the pattern of the Bible. Our consultation is absolutely critical. Jeroboam's counsel was a human wisdom. And this leads to our third point. He approached his service to God based on a human wisdom. And this is my thoughts. I think it was sourced in um, at least convenience and trying to please people, to please the majority of people. What is, you know, these are things that business and engineers and inventors think about. What can I make or what can I sell that people like? Right? I mean, it does, you don't have to look too far to understand that we as humans like convenience. This has driven the innovation, driven the invention of microwaves and cars and now self-driving cars, dishwashers. We like things fast and easy. And that's a human wisdom that drives, you know, processes and decision making in business. What's convenient for people? What's going to attract the most people? And I do think that that filtered into Jeroboam's thought process a little bit. Um, consider two of the institutions that Jeroboam instituted, namely uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. He changed the date and decided to do it somewhere else, and then also appointing non-Levitical priests. So consider the Feast of Tabernacles. He appointed on a similar date. It was supposed to be uh, month 7, day 15, and he decided to do it um, month 8, day 15, a month later. Now, from what I could research, it seems like the agricultural patterns... We're, by the way, this feast was associated with eating food, right? It's a celebration. And if we're going to tell people, don't go to Jerusalem, I am afraid that you're going to go back to being loyal to Rehoboam. I want you to stay here. Let's celebrate the Feast of Booths here. But we, it would be best if it was sort of optimized for the, the, when the harvest was, right? Because the harvest peaked in, this, in month 7, day 15, but because um, the northern kingdom was further north than Jer Jerusalem, the agricultural patterns were such that it was better from a harvest perspective to do it a month later. So for the sake of convenience, for the sake of optimizing enjoyment of the people, let's take some liberty and move it a month later. And we too can be susceptible to this. <clears throat> and then the second point, appointing non-Levitical priests. You know, priests were supposed to be in the tribe of Levi and descendants of Aaron. And you think about what might have motivated this. What's more attractive to people to say, any of you can be a priest? Who wants to be a priest? Oh, I do. All right, come on. Anyone can be a priest. Uh, is that more attractive or is it more attractive to say that only Levites can be priests? can be priests. People might have made an argument to the people. Uh, we're the, we, we are forwarding inclusivity to appoint anyone a priest. This is more inclusive. The majority of people were non-Levite. Maybe Jeroboam was appealing to that tendency of humans. You know, what, what, what's gonna, what, what sounds better to people? You recall when Korah led a rebellion in Numbers chapter 16, verse 3. It says, They assembled together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You've gone far enough, for all the congregations are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is in their midst. So why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? Korah was leading a rebellion against Moses and Aaron, saying, You're exalting yourself. But God is the one that exalted them. It was God's decision to make you know, Levites be the ones who were in service to God to make the descendants of Aaron to be the ones who were the priests. It wasn't their decision. These people weren't happy with it. And what do they appeal to? They say, aren't we holy too? We're good people, right? They made decisions based on a human wisdom, what they thought was unfair and what they thought was, was uh, just. 
A problem that underlies both of these examples is institution of the feast whenever it was convenient for when harvest was peaking, although it was in the wrong date. His appointing of non-Levitical priests, what underlies both of them is Jeroboam assumed that there was liberty when there was none. He assumed, I have the freedom to make a choice when he did not have such freedom. God had instituted things in a particular way, and he did not authorize the authority to change that. He did not authorize Jeroboam the authority to make things be whatever he needed them or wanted them to be, whatever he thought was in, in the best interest of the way he was going to do things. But Jeroboam compromised, perhaps for the sake of convenience, perhaps for the sake of pleasing people, and perhaps, well, for sure, to satisfy his own fears of the people returning to Rehoboam. And ultimately, this stemmed from a lack of faith. So the sins of Jeroboam, which eventually led to Assyrian exile, I think that they were sourced in Jeroboam having a lack of faith. Number one, he sought consultation, but not from God. Number two, and number three, he approached his service to God on a human wisdom. As we close this morning, I want to return to our scripture reading in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. As we talk about the wisdom that we ought to pursue, I ultimately want to bring everything back to Jesus every time. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we read verses 18 through 25. Consider here verses 26 and on. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. The base things of the world and the despised God has chosen. He has elected things and he has set things up in a way that might not be what people would naturally come to according to their own human wisdom. Jeroboam. You might not come to the same conclusions as God, but what is called for us to do is to humble ourselves and adhere. And Jeroboam was promised an enduring kingdom if he would just do that. The way that you want to do things, Jeroboam, is not necessarily consistent with the way that I've set things up. The base things of the world and the despised God has chosen. What the world sees as foolishness, God has chosen. Don't trust your own wisdom. The things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are. Verse 29, so that no man may boast before God but by his doing you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. If you remember from the scripture reading, he's, contra or he's constantly referring to Jews and Greeks and sort of the ways that they go about things. The Greeks revered an eloquent system of logic and that sort of wisdom, and the Jews sought righteousness according to works. And what Paul does here is brilliant. He says Christ is our wisdom. Christ is our eloquent logic. And for the Jews who sought righteousness after works, he says, Christ is our righteousness. We are righteous because of God. So that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. And he continues in chapter 2. And when I come to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom. I didn't come with some sophisticated system of logic and philosophy like the Greeks do, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's the one thing Paul was going to hang his hat on. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. And that is the crux of the matter. Jeroboam rested his faith, he rested his faith on the wisdom of men. He relied on a human wisdom thinking the way he wanted to think. And Paul says, put your faith on the power of God. In verse 18, he calls the power of God the word of the cross. The word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God, the message of the gospel, the life of Jesus, his crucifixion, the fact that the tomb was empty the greatest demonstration of love that the world has ever seen, and ultimately what brought us salvation. And we're called to rest our faith on that same wisdom, the power of God, the gospel of Jesus.
I want to invite you also to rest your hope and faith, not on the wisdom of men, but on this power of God, the word of the cross and the gospel of Jesus. If you haven't dedicated your life to Christ, you can do it now. You can repent and decide to crucify that old man and live like that no longer and dedicate your life to Jesus and have your sins washed away in the baptistry. Be forgiven of every sin you've ever committed. You can do this now as we stand and sing.